to open my account. Okay. some hopefully nice things to say about you. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised David didn't go a half hour over. No, no, I'm saying he didn't. I was surprised by that. Okay. Yeah, it's a 45 plus five. Roughly. You know, it, it's close. Probably shouldn't tell you. <laughs> you know, because lunch is nice. A little bit of flexibility. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, yeah, please be seated. Okay, I am extremely pleased to introduce Juan Maldacena. He is a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and is responsible for the ADS CFT correspondence, which you already heard about and I'm sure you'll hear, hear more about. It's a conjecture about the equivalence of string theory and on, uh, and, uh, on ADS space, uh, anti de Sitter space, and conformal field theory defined on the boundary of that space. Uh, to translate that into English, uh, 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 and gauge theories are what we use to describe the other forces. It's truly a profound development. It completely changed our understanding of gravity. It's won so many awards, hard to count them, but um, let me point out two of them. One is, the Sloan Foundation Fellowship, uh, which was also won by Mani in 1959, and the Dirac Medal. His lecture today is on the entropy of Hawking radiation. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here at this celebration of the Bagmik Institute. Um, and we thank uh, Mani for his generosity and uh, his vision to establish this institute. And I'm glad to see it's working wonderfully and with lots of wonderful activities. Um, so my talk today um, is based on black holes and black holes have been in the news recently due to uh, wonderful astronomical observations. However, I will mainly talk about quantum aspects of black holes. And uh, we'll discuss some recent progress on the black hole information problem. And what we'll be, I'll talk about will be based on this review that uh, we wrote recently. You can find a general uh, discussion, hopefully understandable for uh, people with no background in this field. Um, and these developments are based on two important papers from 2019 by these two series of authors. And there's another interesting set of developments by these authors that I will not review in this, uh, this talk. So the outline is, first I will remind you of a very influential formula um, for about black holes, which it says that the black hole entropy is equal to the area of the horizon. Then uh, we'll discuss another black hole entropy formula, a different one, which says that the entropy is equal to a certain minimal area, so a different formula. And then we'll use this uh, new formula for computing the entropy of Hawking radiation coming out of black holes. And the bottom line is that we will get a result that is consistent with information conservation as opposed to information loss. 
And this talk will not be historical, but hopefully it will be pedagogical. Now, the, the most important result about quantum black holes is uh, that black holes have a temperature, uh, a temperature with, which is inversely proportional to the size of the black hole. Um, that means that the typical uh, wavelength of radiation coming out of a black hole is equal to the size of the black hole. In particular, this implies that you can have white black holes. So it's even a contradiction to the name black holes. Um, I leave it to you to figure out how big a white black hole should be. So I just told you the answer. But, um, now, there is one way to understand uh, why this arises, how the temperature arises, and I'll sort of briefly go over it. And before we talk about black holes, I will remind you of a certain technique uh, that we can use to calculate the partition function of uh, thermal systems. So uh, just by definition, the partition function of a quantum system is the trace of e to the minus beta h, where h is the Hamiltonian. And this, this calculation can be interpreted as evolution in Euclidean time on a circle of length beta. So that's because Lorentzian evolution would have an i and a t there, uh, and we have no i, so that's why we have Euclidean time as opposed to Lorentzian time. And on a circle, because we are identifying sort of the initial state and the final state and summing over all those states uh, to get this trace. And so that's why we have time answer. And this is true for any system. This is true for the partition function of a harmonic oscillator at finite temperature, of a hydrogen atom, of a quantum field theory, and so on. And uh, so that's a general fact. And the temperature is one over beta, which is the length of the Euclidean circle. So now uh, let's uh, go back to the black hole and we now consider, uh, consider the metric of a black hole. So this is the metric that Schwarzschild wrote in, um, in the beginning of the 20th century. And um, we're going to modify this metric. We are going to take time and make it Euclidean. So we make time Euclidean. All we do is change, change the sign in the metric. Now we have a metric whose all directions are uh, space-like. And uh, where before we had the horizon at r equal to rs, what's happening is that this uh, coefficient in the metric is uh, shrinking to zero size. And the interesting observation is that um, that's similar to what happens uh, when you go to the center of Euclidean space, two-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, so there, if you describe it uh, using radial coordinates, also the size of the circle is shrinking to zero size. Um, and that's not singular. But in order for that to be non-singular, we need that the period of the uh, Euclidean uh, time direction is some particular, has a particular value. So otherwise we would have a conical singularity at that point. And so um, you can find that uh, there is a particular period uh, for the Euclidean time direction, such that this metric is completely non-singular. So that's just a mathematical observation, just a math simply a mathematical observation about the Euclidean Schwarzschild metric. And then you look at uh, what that metric looks like and you find that that metric uh, is, uh, well, far away. Uh, there is, so all these functions go to one and we have a circle of length beta. Uh, I, I name it beta, but well, it's given by this expression, but we can think of that then as a system at finite temperature. We, we, said that uh, we, when we have a Euclidean circle of length beta, then we have, we are calculating something where we have, uh, um, we are far away we are calculating the thermal partition function of uh, fields or gravity at finite temperature. Um, and then we can interpret then the solution as saying that we have a black hole in thermal equilibrium with uh, a system at finite temperature beta. And, the absence of singularities interpreted as the idea that the black hole is in thermal equilibrium. Therefore, the black hole temperature is given by that formula. So that's a derivation of the formula. Now, this formula implies that black holes have an entropy. Um, so if you know the relationship between the energy and the temperature, so the, there is a relationship that comes from solving the equations between the mass of the black hole and the size. And then there's a relationship between the temperature and the mass. You integrate this relationship, you get some formula for the entropy. Uh, this is using the first law of thermodynamics. And then the formula for the entropy is just the area divided by 
uh, G Newton. And um, so it ends up, ends up being this formula. Of course, the, this gives an enormous entropy for a big black hole. In fact, uh, most of the entropy of the universe would be dominated by the entropies of, um, of black holes at the center of the galaxy. But anyway, so this uh, formula uh, is called the hawking bekenstein formula, and uh, it's an interesting and important property of black holes. So all this, uh, all this is telling us that black holes uh, look like thermodynamic objects, some objects with a temperature, and this is certainly surprising. Uh, now, before we continue, we'll discuss in more detail the geometry of a black hole. So uh, the geometry of black holes is conveniently represented in terms of uh, certain diagrams, which are called Penrose diagrams. These are diagrams of the geometry that represent the geometry of space-time. Uh, in these diagrams that we are going to draw today, we are not never going to draw the directions of the sphere. We are going to consider spherically symmetric configurations, and we never uh, draw the direction of the sphere. So we only draw the direction of the radial direction and also the time direction. Uh, we've rescaled uh, the geometry in such a way as to bring the infinite uh, space far away to a finite position. Um, and uh, we've done this in such a way that the light rays that are moving radially inwards or outwards move at 45 degrees. Um, so for example, the light ray coming out, coming into the black hole would go along a 45 degree line like this um, and so on. So here, this is the diagram then using those rules. This is the diagram that describes uh, a star in uh, flat space. So this region far away is the asymptotic region of flat space, the region far away. Um, and this is the surface of the star. This is r equal to zero, the center of the star. So this is a star that is collapsing. Uh, here it looks like it has zero size. So that's because of the rescaling, but the star comes, uh, maybe had a big size at early times, and then it starts collapsing. Um, and then um, what happens is that there is a point here in the future where the size of the two-dimensional sphere that we are not drawing uh, goes to zero size. And here the curvature of space-time becomes infinite. That's called the singularity. Um, if we consider light rays that come out from the center of the star, so light rays that come out early on can uh, reach infinity, while light rays that depart er later, they will end up at the singularity and cannot reach infinity. And there is a last, uh, there is a light ray, which is somewhere in between where uh, it starts coming out. And then here it, um, it has, uh, the, the, it, it really never, never manages to come out or to fall in. That last light ray, we call it the horizon. They, they span the surface that we call the horizon. Nothing special is happening here for an observer who falls in. An observer who falls in follows a time-like trajectory and will end up at the singularity if it, uh, once it reaches in the, into the interior. So that's the uh, space uh, solution describing uh, black hole collapse. It was written in the 30s. Um, now, one interesting feature uh, is that the area of the horizon starts out being zero here, and it increases until it reaches a maximal value. And then uh, it continues having a constant value as you uh, go further out. And the metric here, I didn't say it, but the metric here in the white region is the metric of the Schwarzschild solution. The metric in the green region is different because now we have matter. Okay, the Schwarzschild solution is the solution with no matter. Now, this fact that the area increases is true in this particular collapse situation, but it's also true in any possible collapse situation, even without spherical symmetry, with colliding black holes, and, and so on. And that's a general uh, result that you can prove using the equations of general relativity. And with the interpretation of the uh, area as the entropy, then this uh, classical general relativity result becomes a result uh, about, um, it becomes the second law of thermodynamics, consistent with second law of thermodynamics. Now, you, you, might, you, you might, one confusion that sometimes arises in this context is that uh, the equations of general relativity are time reversal symmetric, while the second law appears not to be. Well, the second law is definitely not. But here, the time reversal symmetry is uh, broken by saying what the horizon. So these are future horizons. So these are horizons that are defined uh, by going far into the future. We could define similarly past horizons, and there we would have the opposite behavior. Now, 
the, the, the full formula for the entropy is actually not the area of the horizon, but it's the formula that includes also the entropy of matter outside the horizon. So this is the formula telling us what the full entropy of the uh, cold configuration is of the uh, outside of the black hole. So in, including the matter outside the black hole. And an important feature is that this entropy of the matter includes the entropy of the quantum field, just of the quantum field theory vacuum. And there is a non-trivial entropy because um, the vacuum state extends both inside and outside the black hole. And we are just only considering the region outside. And um, when you consider only a portion of space time, uh, the vacuum, which is a pure state, uh, looks like a mixed state because you're only looking at the portion of that state. The same way that if you had uh, two spins, if you in an entangled state, if you look at the, both of them, you have a pure state, but if you look at only one, uh, you might have a non-trivial non entropy. And that's uh, an extra contribution to the entropy of the black hole. It's a contribution from the quantum fields. And once you include these two terms, then uh, the, this, this whole, whole expression obeys the second law of thermodynamics, um, even in situations where there are quantum corrections. For example, uh, when the black hole evaporates. So when the black hole evaporates, the area decreases. And if you thought that the entropy was just the area, you would just get a contradiction with the second law of thermodynamics. But if you remember that you should include the entropy of these quantum fields, uh, then uh, the black hole is evaporated, it's emitting Hawking radiation. And when you sum the two terms, you find that the entropy actually increases during the process of black hole evaporation. So uh, now this, these results have inspired the very influential hypothesis. Um, I, it's a, and we can call this hypothesis a central dogma in the uh, study of quantum aspects of black holes. Uh, dogma is a sense of hypothesis. Um, so the idea is that a black hole as seen from the outside can be described by a quantum system with a finite number of degrees of freedom or further the entropy or further the area in Planck units. Um, and these degrees of freedom evolve according to unitary evolution as seen from the outside. So here the idea is that we sit outside the black hole and we do all kinds of experiments. We are free to do any experiments on the black hole. We can send in matter. We can uh, see what Hawking radiation comes out. We can do these experiments with arbitrary precision and so on. So this is the setup. And the idea is that for all those experiments, we can replace the black hole by a certain uh, quantum system. So the idea is that we sit at uh, some distance from the black hole, let's say a distance bigger than this uh, surface. And so we never get into these regions and we replace the whole space time uh, within these regions uh, inside the dotted line. Uh, by some system of qubits, interacting qubits. The hypothesis itself doesn't tell us uh, what the system is. It only tells us that there is some system with some particular Hamiltonian. It's just uh, an idea that this Hamiltonian exists. And this has been a very influential uh, hypothesis. Is, um, it involves a certain element of faith in the sense that um, we, it's not something we can currently derive from the loss of general relativity. Um, it's something we think it's true in any, it should be true in any quantum theory of gravity, but we cannot derive from first principles from the gravitational description. Uh, so it's, um, now, um, so when uh, we calculate, for example, the black, black hole thermodynamics, um, so there is uh, a cal this calculation, uh, so we can calculate the gravitational action of this configuration. And what we find is that uh, this gravitational action can be interpreted as trace over uh, some Hilbert space. And we think that that Hilbert space is the Hilbert space that appeared in that central dogma we talked about, that, that central hypothesis. We don't know exactly what this Hilbert space is. We only know, we assume that its dimension is finite and we think it exists. And much of the language we will use uh, for describing the rest of the results assumes this uh, idea but um, the, the, the results themselves uh, do not assume the idea, okay? Uh, so they can be viewed as uh, evidence for that idea. Now, what's the evidence for, for this idea? Um, well, first, uh, there is uh, entropy counting in special theories, such as uh, string theory, and using uh, supersymmetry, you can count uh, certain black holes um, very precisely and find uh, the area formula, and not only the area formula, but also corrections to the area. 
Then you have the ads cft correspondence, which you can view as a refinement or a special case of that uh, hypothesis where there is a statement about what the Hamiltonian is. So you say that cutoff surface we discussed around the black hole, which we take it to infinity very far away. And we say that the whole space time around the black hole is described by a thermal system uh, living on the boundary. And we say exactly what the Hamiltonian is supposed to be. Uh, but it's, it's still a, a, a conjecture in the sense, or a hypothesis in the sense that we don't know how to derive that Hamiltonian directly from the bulk point of view. So, okay, so those are, that's some evidence in favor, but there is also uh, some evidence against. So, and this uh, was provided by uh, Stephen Hawking, who said that this could not possibly be true. And so let's see, let's review uh, Hawking's argument. So Hawking's argument uh, was based, uh, is, this a, is this a laser pointer also? Yeah. Is this a pointer? Because my pointer somehow ran out of battery. Well, anyway. Okay, well, it doesn't matter, okay. Um, good, so uh, we are going to consider the entropy of an evaporating black hole from, from collapse. And so we have, um, we have the geometry similar to the one we had before. But now the difference is that the black hole evaporates completely. So the, the, we, we have uh, the process of black hole evaporation that is creating pairs of particles. One pair, member of the pair uh, escapes to infinity and the other one goes to, into the black hole. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so, um, and, and this process uh, happens over and over again. And initially these two states are in a pure state, these two, the, the Hawking particle that goes to infinity and its partner are in a pure state, uh, but one member goes to infinity, the other member goes into the singularity. And after the black hole evaporates, we have all the members that are, have gone to infinity. Uh, and then we have the partners uh, behind the horizon and the, the, the black hole evaporated completely here. We don't know exactly what's happening, but uh, at the very, very end, uh, however, we think that uh, essentially what will happen is that the two space time somehow disconnect from each other. Um, and so then uh, Hawking said, well, uh, this radiation is entangled with the interior, it's forming a pure state, but we cannot measure whatever is in the interior. So if you sit outside, uh, you cannot measure what's in the interior. And therefore, um, we get some entropy that actually increases and a pure state uh, goes into a mixed state. Okay. That was uh, his argument. Um, now, this is, uh, this is somehow a restatement of what he was saying. Uh, he was saying, roughly speaking, that uh, you have some process such as the black hole evaporation, uh, black hole formation and evaporation which uh, you can view it as a situation where you start from some universe and then uh, you end up with the same universe filled with radiation, the results of Hawking evaporation. And then another disconnected universe, which consists of the singularity essentially in the future. And, um, and that is disconnected. Um, and so it's a second universe and it's entangled, it's entangled with the first one. Uh, or the quantum fields are entangled with the first one, but you don't have access to the second one. And so the entropy increased. It's not, he said, well, it's not very mysterious. It's similar to a particle that decays into two particles uh, that are entangled with each other. And if you look at only one, then you will see entropy increasing. Um, so the, the idea is that the purity would be preserved only if you consider all possible universes in the far future, not if you consider just the universe uh, where you started from. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a slightly better statement of the problem that, uh, so where we don't have to uh, say anything about the, what happens at the very last stages of Hawking evaporation. So in that statement of the problem, what we do is we compute the fine grain entropy of the radiation. So we compute the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation as it comes out of the black hole. And what we see is that if initially the black hole was formed, let's say in a pure state, this entropy would start increasing. Um, and will continue to increase until the black hole evaporates completely. We don't know exactly what happens at the very end, uh, but the idea is that it increases monotonically. On the other hand, the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole or the area of the black hole uh, decreases uh, monotonically as uh, time goes on. And 
In the beginning, it could be that this increase of the entropy is uh, due to the fact that this, this radiation is entangled with the degrees of freedom of the black hole. Okay, so that's fine. Um, but there is a contradiction that happens uh, when these two entropies cross each other. Because at this point, uh, let's say there is some entropy, naive entropy of Hawking radiation, and this entropy cannot come from entanglement with the remaining degrees of freedom. So at that point, we have a contradiction with that uh, central dogma or central hypothesis. Okay? And we have this contradiction in a, in a place where the black hole is still very big and we can trust this. I mean, we naively would say that we can trust the semi-classical approximation. So there is no funny issue about what happens at the very late stages of evaporation, where the black hole is very small and we cannot trust uh, semi-classical gravity. So um, Don Page said that uh, if black hole formation and evaporation is unitary, then the entropy of radiation should follow this curve, this curve given by the purple line. It's now called the Page curve. Uh, now this problem uh, involves understanding uh, fine grain entropy. So um, there are two notions of entropy uh, that we often uh, use in physics, and it's important for this discussion to distinguish these two notions. So first is uh, the fine grain entropy or Feynman entropy of a quantum system. Uh, it's given by this definition. So if you have the density matrix of the quantum system, you calculate rho, rho log rho, and this gives a notion of entropy. Then uh, there is the so-called coarse grain entropy, or sometimes called thermodynamic entropy or Boltzmann entropy. These are different names for the same thing. And this is the entropy that obeys the second law. So it uh, can increase even if you have an isolated system. And it arises from a certain sloppiness from the fact that you are looking only at a subset of all possible observables. So that's why this one is called fine grain, which means you look at all possible observables. It's subtle to define this one precisely. Here, we're only mentioning to, to contra contrast, contrast it with the other one, with the fine grain entropy one. Now, just to help you distinguish between these two notions, let's uh, look at the difference in one example, which uh, will help you see what the difference is. So imagine we have a little box uh, full of gas inside a bigger box. And at time equal to zero, we open the little box and this gas uh, comes out. This is a unitary process. Um, and uh, if we had some initial density matrix for the gas in the little box, uh, this uh, unitary process will lead to a density matrix for the gas in the, in the, in the big box. And the entropy, the fine grain entropy in the final, in the final situation is, um, is actually equal to the initial entropy because this unitary matrix can be pulled out of this trace and uh, you get the same answer. So here, uh, the fine entropy has not changed. Um, in some sense, what this is saying is that if you do very precise observations on the molecules on this gas, you somehow can see that they are not occupying all of the phase space or all of the possible states because they came from a situation where at some point in the past, they were in a smaller box. On the other hand, uh, when we do ordinary thermodynamics, we say that this is a, an irreversible process that has increased the entropy because we are just coarse graining. We are not looking at the very fine details of this gas. And so then the, the entropy has increased in this process. So that's uh, these two notions of entropy. Um, now, whenever we are going to be talking about entropy now in the the rest of the talk, we'll talk about the entropy of the black hole as seen from the outside. This would be the entropy of this quantum system that would have, was appearing in the, that uh, central hypothesis we mentioned in the beginning. Now, the first uh, point is that the horizon area uh, is computing the thermodynamic entropy, the entropy of the second kind, not the fine grain entropy. And the reason is that it was increasing uh, under, um, under sort of unitary evolution. When the black hole was forming, that entropy was increasing, right? Um, so how do we compute the fine grain entropy? So in general, it's very difficult to compute the fine grain entropy of some, some system. Like for example, in ordinary thermodynamics, we don't have a simple formula for the fine grain entropy. Uh, as we saw in the case of the gas in the box, it's uh, quite difficult. Um, however, it's interesting that in these gravitational systems, we have a formula that a proposed formula for the fine grain entropy. 
And this is a form that initially started, uh, was proposed by Ruren Takayanagi, and it was later improved by uh, several other authors. And we'll see uh, now the final uh, proposal, which is the one here. So the idea is that we, we start with an expression uh, similar to the expression for the entropy of the black hole uh, in terms of uh, the area of some surface plus the entropy of quantum fields outside that surface. So here we imagine that uh, we want to compute the entropy of whatever is uh, inside this. Remember the purple surface was the black hole and we draw a sphere somehow at some distance from the black hole and we want to compute the entropy of everything that is within this sphere. Then uh, we uh, draw a spatial slice up to some surface X. So this is a two-dimensional surface X. This uh, sphere is a three-dimensional surface. Um, and then we have the area of the surface plus the entropy of the quantum fields outside the surface. Um, and then we compute this. And then we move the surface, uh, let's say in, inwards or outwards uh, in such a way that we sort of extremize the value of this quantity. So we move it until uh, there is no change to first order in the motion, either in the space direction or in the time direction for this surface. So that's uh, what we call an extremal surface. And um, then if there is more than one surface, then we have to minimize and find uh, the one that has the minimal value for the, for the answer. And so this final surface is the minimal. So the one that was extremal, sometimes called quantum extremal surface, it's called quantum because it includes the entropy of the quantum fields here. Not the perfect name, but that's the name that has uh, been chosen, unfortunately. Um, and the, the crucial point here, in the, the crucial point in this whole story is that we are allowed to take the surface to the interior of the black hole. And so the, the value of this quantity will depend on the geometry of the interior of the black hole. So we can have two black holes which have exactly the same, same geometry outside the black hole, but if they have different interior geometries, they will have different values for this uh, fine grain entropy. So we can say that uh, the interior of the black hole um, encodes fine details about the state of the black hole. Um, so that's just some interpretation, but uh, this is according to this definition. So here, here I have given you this definition of this entropy, but uh, there is also a, a derivation of this entropy that is similar to the derivation of the uh, other formula for the black hole entropy. I, I won't discuss that in detail. So we'll discuss that derivation later. For now, we will use it, and I will, I will show you how to use it. Now, you should be surprised in general by the claim that there is a formula for fine grain entropy. So, so that, that tells you that uh, this analysis of black holes is different than thermodynamics. So black holes from outside have many similarities with thermodynamics, but um, once we use this formula and we are sensitive to the details of the interior, the similarity with thermodynamics uh, sort of goes away because in thermodynamics, we don't have such a simple formula. So uh, let's uh, discuss some examples. So we could consider the Schwarzschild solution. So the Schwarzschild solution uh, describes, this is just a vacuum structural solution, maximally analytically extended. It describes not one black hole, but two black holes that are connected to each other and have a, a Penrose diagram of this form with two black hole exteriors and connected through a kind of wormhole. Uh, so in this situation, we can take the surface inside and the area starts decreasing and it reaches a minimum where these two horizons meet. And then if you were to continue to move it to, to the other side, the area will start increasing. So the minimum uh, lies here. And that's, um, that th in this case, the fine grain entropy is equal actually to the area of the horizon. So it agrees with the, in that case, it agrees with the hawking Bekenstein entropy. Now let's uh, go back to the case of a, a black hole that has just formed. So in this case, uh, we can take the surface uh, into the interior and we can take it all the way to R equal to zero where the area term shrinks completely. And that, um, that will, that's the particular case of an extremal surface where the area is actually zero. Um, and in this case, uh, we find that the entropy comes purely from the entropy of quantum fields on this surface. And that includes the entropy of whatever matter made the star, okay? So if we compute the entropy, this fine grain entropy, we'll find a result which is equal to the entropy of the star. And notice that that was the same as the entropy of the star before it was formed, okay? So we 
we see that it obeys the property of fine grain entropy in the sense that um, we have the process of black hole collapse and the entropy um, after the collapse, the fine grain entropy after the collapse is equal to the fine grain entropy before the collapse. So the idea is that this collapse of the black hole is similar to this process of opening the box, right? Uh, it's a process where if you look at the fine details, uh, you find no entropy increase. In this case, uh, looking at the fine details means looking at the interior of the black hole, the entropy remains the same. Uh, while uh, if you look at the area of the horizon, the area of the horizon has increased. So the hawking bekenstein formula has actually increased. And so we should think of that as uh, thermodynamics or Boltzmann entropy of the black hole, which increases under this irreversible process. Um, now, the, the new development in the, in the last couple, well, in 2019, was uh, the realization that if you have a black hole that has been evaporating for quite some time, uh, then uh, there is a second extremal surface that uh, exists uh, somewhat behind the horizon. Um, and in order to see that this is an extremal surface, you have to balance some term that has to do with the decrease of the area as you go to the interior with the increase of the entropy due to the uh, effects of Hawking radiation. And then you balance these two terms. I won't discuss how that works in detail, but uh, you have to believe me that, uh, or believe these authors. Well, actually you can go and read the papers and be convinced that this is the case. Um, but um, the, there is a second, the second uh, extremal surface here. And so for these cases, uh, there will be, a, and the final result for the entropy is somewhat similar to the area of the horizon at that time, okay? So uh, in these situations now, uh, let's suppose, let's go back to the case of the evaporating black hole and see uh, what happens. So at any time through the evaporation, there are two uh, extremal surfaces. One is the trivial surface where the, uh, we, we go all the way to the center of the star and we uh, shrink it completely. And in this case, uh, the entropy at early times was the entropy of the star. Let's say for simplicity, the star was in a pure state that was zero. Um, and then uh, as uh, time progresses, uh, so some modes leave the system. And then when we calculate the entropy here, we'll get an entropy that is increasing due to the presence of the partners of Hawking radiation. And so we get this increasing curve uh, for the entropy of the black hole. Um, on the other hand, uh, from this uh, new surface, we get an entropy which is roughly equal to the area of the horizon at the time. So we get a decrease in, uh, and a decrease in entropy. And the formula is instructing us to take the minimum of these two. So these are two possibilities. And then at any time, we just have to keep the, pick the minimum of these two surfaces. And um, we get, um, we get uh, this curve, which uh, looks uh, very much like uh, the page curve, but for the entropy of the black hole, okay? So here we see that the entropy of the black hole increases and then it decreases. Now we get a, a curve that looks like the page curve for the black hole, but what we really wanted is the same type of curve, but for the entropy of radiation, okay? Um, now the radiation lives uh, far away in a region where uh, gravity effects look like they're very small. So it could have left uh, this anti-Sitter space we were talking about, or it could be collected in a far away quantum computer. So it's radiation that you, you collect it, it's uh, sitting there somewhere. And the, it seems to be completely straightforward to compute its entropy. However, since we uh, obtain the state using gravity, the idea is that we should apply uh, the gravitational fine grain entropy formula for computing its entropy. So we shouldn't apply the naive usual formula we apply in quantum field theory, but we, in order to get an accurate result, we need to apply this uh, gravitational uh, formula. And the idea is that if you apply uh, this gravitational formula, um, then uh, the radiation lives in the region outside the black hole. So it's uh, this region here, but the idea is that you, you could in principle uh, include uh, a region which is inside the black hole. And you can call this some kind of island. So it's, uh, we are calculating the entropy of radiation, the fine grain entropy of radiation. And then we include this region which is in the interior of the black hole. And if um, 
if the area of this surface here plus the semi-classical entropy of the radiation union with this uh, region here in the interior, if, if that quantity is smaller than the entropy purely on the radiation, then it might be convenient to do this. And we are instructed to actually do it and find uh, an entropy that uh, will be smaller. Um, and so you, you could view this as a special case of the general formula for the gravitational uh, Frangian entropy. Um, and in fact, uh, when you go through the derivation of the Frangian entropy formula, you find that this is essentially a special case. Uh, and it looks surprising, but uh, it's uh, the way uh, this formula works. And once you do that, then you find that if, uh, for example, the initial matter state was pure, then the quantum extremal surfaces are actually the same as the ones we discussed before. And we get exactly the same, uh, we, we, we get the page curve now for the radiation, okay? Which is what we expected from unitarity. And so the news is that uh, we've gotten this formula from doing a gravitational configuration, a gravitational calculation. So we did the calculation purely following the strict roots of gravity. We didn't assume anything. We didn't assume the central hypothesis. We didn't assume the central dogma that we we're talking about. We just did the calculation following the strict gravitational rules for computing fine grain entropy. And we found this uh, result consistent with unitarity. Now, the skeptic might complain. The, the skeptic might say, well, this is just an accounting trick. So we, I have always said that if you included the black hole interior, then the state is pure. So if you consider both interior and the exterior, uh, the state is pure, but the whole problem arises because you don't have access to the interior. Now, but I, I think we should not think of it as a trick. It should be viewed more as an oracle. So it's something that we derive from the gravitational path integral. I, I didn't show you the derivation, but uh, you can derive, derive it using the gravitational path integral. Um, and it's an oracle in the sense that it gives you this uh, true fine entropy formula of the exact state, but using only the semi-classical state of uh, the leading order solution. So it's quite surprising that you can get this information just using the semi-classical state. Um, now, I, I told you that this formula can be derived and its derivation, I won't show it to you, but it's conceptually similar to the derivation of the black hole entropy formula given by Gibbons and Hawking. So that, that's a derivation that used that Euclidean black hole geometry that I showed you at some transparency. Uh, you can use that, uh, that geometry to calculate the black hole entropy. And there are sort of modifications of that geometry you can use or that you, you have to use if you want to calculate this, um, this modified, well, the fine grain entropy formula. And the interesting thing is that you can do it by doing this uh, gravity computation. And for the same reason that the Gibbons Hawking formula does not give you information about microstates, this formula also does not give you information about the microstate. So you get the final answer without telling you what the, the state is. So it, cal it calculates the entropy without calculating the density matrix itself. Um, so, so far uh, we've talked about uh, entropy. So the question is, what is this telling us about the interior? Um, so, how do we describe the interior? So this hypothesis we discussed in the beginning uh, involves degrees of freedom uh, that describe the black hole as seen from the outside. But you, you wonder where those same degrees of freedom describe also the interior of the black hole. Um, so the, the hypothesis, the way we formulated it, says, said nothing about the interior. So now we are going to say something about this. Now the question uh, is, does it describe all of the interior, let's say none of the interior or only part of the interior? So these are the three possibilities. And the correct possibility is the last one. So we are going to say that it describes part of the interior. Um, now, which part? So the idea is that uh, they describe the part of the interior that is involved when we calculate the fine grain entropy formula. So, Suppose that we are at some time t where the uh, surface x that appears in calculating the fine grain entropy at this time t is somewhere in the interior of the black hole. Um, then uh, the idea is that uh, we consider the surface here and we look at all the points in space time uh, which are determined by uh, doing evolution with initial conditions on this surface 
So we can determine uh, what happens at any point that is in this wedge shape region. And it's called this, this wedge shape region is called the entanglement wedge. Um, maybe it should be called the entropy wedge because it's the wedge that appears when we calculate the, uh, the fine grain entropy. Um, but, um, okay, so and then the idea is that um, the degrees of freedom that, de that describe the black hole from the outside describe also a portion of the interior. So this portion that uh, lies within the entanglement wedge. So that's uh, again, a more a hypothesis of what region of the interior you can describe. So, um, so in various examples, we see, for example, if you have a black hole at early times where the, uh, the correct surface is the vanishing surface, uh, then this spatial slice goes all the way to the center and the entanglement wedge covers the whole black hole interior. Uh, if we are late times, it covers only a small portion of the black hole interior. Conversely, if we are calculating the entropy of Hawking radiation, when we calculate the entropy of Hawking radiation at late times, we should also include part of the interior. So it means that uh, this region of the interior is uh, somehow being described by the radiation, okay? Not, not, not by the so-called black hole degrees of freedom, but by the radiation degrees of freedom. Um, okay. Um, so if we have this uh, late time situation, part of the interior is described by what we call the black hole degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom that describe the black hole as seen from the outside, and part of uh, this interior is described by the radiation. So what this is saying is that by doing a very complicated operation of the radiation, we can extract information from the interior. So if you have an old black hole that's evaporated for a long time, and someone at very early time sent uh, some message uh, into, into the interior, then by doing a complicated operation, you can extract that information. And we don't, we don't have a clear Lorentzian picture of how that is happening. And so this is in the process of being understood more precisely, but there are some arguments that you can do it. Um, now in conclusions, we reviewed the gravitational fine grain entropy formula. We applied it to the computation of the entropy of radiation, and we obtained results consistent with unitarity. And at late times, uh, most of the interior is part of the radiation, not part of the black hole degrees of freedom. Now you can ask what was uh, Hawking's mistake. And the idea is that he was not using the fine grain gravitational entropy formula. He was using a naive entropy formula. Of course, it wasn't known at the time. This, uh, a lot of what was discussed uh, by thinking about aspect, a lot of what we discussed was derived by thinking about aspects of ADS-CFT, which itself involved uh, string theory and so on. But in order to apply the formulas we discussed, you only need to know gravity as an effective field theory. So they don't depend, these formulas do not depend on any of those details. Um, and this shows that there is an amazingly deep connection between gravity and quantum mechanics. So these formulas that involve geometry, geometries of surfaces and so on, have interpretation in terms of uh, the von Neumann entropy of some quantum system and are consistent with properties of von Neumann entropies of quantum systems. It's quite, quite a non-trivial uh, agreement. Uh, now you can wonder whether well, this means that the information puzzle is solved or not. Now, I would say that one aspect of the puzzle, which is to compute the entropy, uh, it is solved in the sense that there is a purely gravitational way of computing the entropy. Now, there are some other aspects like uh, understanding what the state is or understanding what the precise density matrix is, then that, that has not been understood yet, at least from the point of view of gravity. So if you assume, let's say, the CFT, then you, you could say it's solved, but uh, you would, in order to find the full solution, you would also like to um, understand it from the gravity point of view, and that's not understood. Um, now, for the future, we expect that, uh, well, that there are many questions that remain, so we would like to understand what this is telling us about the black hole singularity, and one, one of the main uh, ideas for, one of the main motivations for, under, for studying black holes is that uh, by understanding black holes well enough, we will understand the black hole singularity. And by understanding that, we'll perhaps be able to time reverse and understand the Big Bang singularity and understand then some lessons for cosmology. This is somehow the long-term plan in uh, this kind of line of research. Okay, thank you.
Thanks a lot for that uh, profound and elegant talk. Um, are there any questions or comments from the audience? Yes. Yeah. Not at all an expert in the, the subject, but I, I remember seeing Tuff giving a talk about re resolving uh, the information paradox mm -hmm. uh, uh, in his way of looking at, at things. So, so how would that relate to what you have been talking about? Um, so he, he essentially ignores totally what happens within the black hole. And I think yes, uh, yes. He, he doesn't sum over the, 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 the radiation that enters the, the black hole. Yes. And yes. somehow keeps it a pure state and uh, this sort of thing. Well, I, I, I think that the difference is that uh, these results are based on the gravitational path integral and can be derived. Um, his story is based on some hypotheses that do not look consistent with uh, the results uh, that we discussed here um, and, and with properties of semi-classical physics. Okay, so, so where, where does the inconsistency with what you presented show up? Well, I'm, I'm referring to some hypotheses that he had on uh, taking the Penrose diagram of a black hole and identifying the, the left and right sides. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that... I mean, that does not describe the, the, the properties of an old black hole as, as we can calculate them from uh, semi-classical physics. Uh, so it Im implies some kind of deviation from the rules. This is consistent with the rules. I mean, he, here the, the new thing is that you can derive these properties uh, with the essentially standard rules of uh, general relativity, uh, semi-classical general relativity, where it involves summing over geometries and so on. Yeah. yeah so it's not, it's not based on ad hoc hypothesis. It's, it's a very conservative uh, derivation, just assuming semi-classical physics. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, the, I, I, would, I would say, I mean, Hawking is not here with us, but he would agree completely with this derivation, um, I think. <laughs> of course, I'm putting words in his mouth. But, uh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, there is something that we can do. Uh, no, nothing. Oh, okay. oh, maybe one more then, then we'll break the so, is there a firewall for a free-falling observer? Um, okay, so um, I think I think for these evaporating black holes, this result suggests that there isn't. Um, now. There could be a, a firewall in situations where um, the where we have a black hole that has existed for a very long time, uh, and so there are some ideas that perhaps there could be a, a firewall if you um, have a black hole and you reflect the radiation, get, make it fall back in, and you wait for exponentially long times. And there are some arguments, some some upcoming paper by Douglas Stanford and Chen Bing Yang who give some, uh, some, some derivation of the, the formation of this firewall in, in that type of circumstance. Yeah, 